All right, so we all know that there is a, um, a, a, you know, a very important and very special mitzvah that we have to care about other people and that we have to treat other people the way we want to be treated, the famous story of Hillel, which we're going to read in a few minutes, um, where a, a, a potential convert came to the study house of Shammai and asked to be taught the entire Torah in the time that he was standing on one foot. And they thought he was making a mockery of the Torah, so they sent him out. Um, then he went to the house, then he went to the, the, the study, ha study house of Hillel, and Hillel answered him, that what you don't like, what you don't appreciate, don't do to your friend. Very simple. Uh, in this week's parsha, we have the three famous words, you should love your fellow as yourself. Um, so in terms of Hillel's statement, Hillel's statement makes a lot more sense. Um, do not treat other people the way you, sorry, do not treat other people the way you wouldn't want to be treated and vice versa, treat other people the way you want to be treated. That's an actionable item. That's something that, that it's difficult, but it's actionable. In other words, we understand that, you know, whether it's to say something to someone or do something for someone or whatever it might be, we should try to ensure that we ask ourselves, would I appreciate that? And making sure that we care about the other person. But this statement in this parsha, the ahafta, which means you shall love, is a very powerful word. We we'll always like love is a very, you know, deep word that's being that's used in many different contexts. Uh, but just about every context that it's used in, other than maybe a parent to a child or a child to the parent, um, every other every other you know context that the word love is used, it, it's it's you know it's deep. It's it's not that it's misunderstood. It's just that it's a very, it holds a lot of weight. Um, you know, when a couple is dating, you know, the first time they say "I love you" to each other is a very, very big deal. Uh, love is a very powerful word on any level, and yet the Torah is commanding us as one of the th uh, six hundred and thirteen mitzvahs that we have to love our fellow, and not just any fellow, but everyone, as we love ourselves. So the question we're going to try to answer is how is it humanly possible to force your natural inclination to love someone? You could say, you know, be nice to them or don't do to them, don't do harm to them. But to ask someone to love somebody else is very difficult. It's like an arranged marriage. Like it doesn't like it doesn't make it doesn't make sense. So let us um, dive right into it. Okay, we're going to go straight to the text. So the, the parsha, the words in the parsha, and this is the whole verse, is you shall neither take revenge, leisikaim, and you shall, uh, or nor bear a grudge, leisitar. It's not really the translation. Uh, leisitar means not to do something. Like, for example, the, the Talmud gives an example. Let's say someone, you ask your friend if you could borrow their axe or their tool or any, you know, anything that they own, and they say no. So then a week later, they come over to you and say, hey, could I borrow something else? And you say, hey, you didn't lend me your thing. Why should I lend you mine? That's nikama. that's revenge, which is forbidden. But what if you say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm better than you, even though you didn't lend me your, your ax, or you didn't lend me your tool, or whatever I wanted to borrow from you, I'm going to be the better man, and I'm going to lend you my thing. That's what's called nitira, or lace, and that's why it's saying leisita. Don't do that either, because that is also considered to be a violation of the Torah. Um, and the last line: "You shall love your fellow as yourself." I am Hashem. Now, interestingly, the Torah uses the whenever a verse ends with the words "Ani Hashem," I am God, or "Vayaresa Malikacha," you should fear God. It's usually when the mitzvah is something that no one else knows other than you and God, if you're fulfilling it or not. Um, so like an example is like, don't, don't cheat somebody else or don't put a, a stumbling block in front of a, a blind person. These are things that, that you can get away with. Um, and it's really between you and God, if you're actually gonna do like, because a stumbling block doesn't just mean a physical stumbling block. It means uh, leading somebody in the wrong direction or giving someone bad advice uh, to trip them up, 
that's all considered to be against the Torah, and only you and God knows if you did that or not. So therefore, the, the verse ends off, Ani Hashem. Um, so telling us that we have to love our fellow as ourselves, which is a very, very tall order, Hashem is reminding us, and I know what's in your heart. I know if you're just doing it for you know, the benefit of, of what you're going to gain from that relationship, or what, I, I know what's going on there. And therefore, I'm reminding you that this is a real mitzvah, a real commandment, and needs to be taken seriously. And Rashi points out, I'm sorry, there, I thought we would have the Rashi in here, but Rashi quotes the great Rabbi Akiva, um, the great sage, who simply says, this is a fundamental principle in the Torah. So back to our question, how is it possible for us to be commanded to love someone else? You know, if it's an actionable item of here's what you should do, here's how you should act is one thing. Love is a heart thing, and we can't all, and most of us don't really have that kind of control over our feelings and emotions. So there's, there's many different answers given. Let's take a look at one of the famous ones. Um, I think it was from the Chizkuna, yeah. So, and this is, this is where you notice that every letter of the Torah is, um, is exact, and there's no extra letter, and every letter is representing something. So look over in the Hebrew. I'm going to point to it on the screen here. The real grammatical term for love your fellow as yourself in Hebrew would be v'ahavta re'acha kamocha. You shall love. Re'acha means your fellow, your friend, or, you know, this other person. Kamocha as yourself. So the Chizkuni, which was a, one of the famous commentaries in the Torah, said that, that the Torah specifically added a lamid before re'acha, v'ahavta l're'acha kamocha, and not the way it would be uh, in natural Hebrew. Why? Because the difference in English is love your fellow as yourself, which is actually incorrect. With the, with the extra letter, with the Laman, it actually means love to your fellow, that you should do loving things for your fellow, because that is something that we could, we could pull off. We could do that. In other words, uh, the idea that deep down in your heart, you have to love somebody else, that's almost impossible for, for most of us. But to do things that are loving to someone else, that is possible. There's a famous story of a, of a, of a young girl who was in a private audience with the Rebbe. And she was bemoaning the fact that she feels like she's not a nice person. She feels like deep down, she's just a bad person. And she's not friendly. She doesn't care about others. And she, she's very worried. You know, she's in school. She's in high school. And she is concerned about her, her character that she's not um, a good person or a nice person. And she's trying to dig deep into her soul to understand you know, who she is and how she, you know, you know, like how she's going to grow up and is she gonna become a, uh, an ax murderer? Like, 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 like what's gonna be? So the Rebbe answered her and asked her a question and said, you know, at school, when you, uh, when it comes to lunchtime, are are people, you know, served directly, or do they have to line up by the buffet? And she answered, No, there's a, you know, the cafeteria, there's a buffet, and everyone has to wait in line with their tray, and they pick up their food, and then they go find the table to sit down. So the Rebbe said, Here's an idea. Uh, for the next week, I want you to tell all your friends to sit down and not wait in line, and you go bring them their food. Ask them what they want, take their orders, almost like a waitress, and bring them their food as a favor. So they could socialize and, and hang out at the table while you bring them their food. Try that for one week. And when this girl is writing the story, she wrote that it changed her life. Because what she realized is, is that sometimes we try to dig deep into ourselves of who we are. Who am I for real? I need to discover myself. I need to find myself. But very often, it's the actions that make us who we are. Uh, there's actually a book, I never read it, but what the title is, You Are What You Do. Uh, and it's, it's not so far off because the way we act and interact with other people is actually a reflection of who we really are. And if we want to change who we are for the better, then we have to make sure those actions are, we start off with those actions. And that's going to impact and influence the way we really are. And she writes that by doing that, she automatically realized that by helping, uh, by, by, by doing something nice for her friends, she was actually turning herself into a nicer person. So if there's ever a question of, you know, how do I, how do I become better or how do I become nicer? Start with the action. And that's where this, this verse, this extra letter Lamed is, is sort of teaching us that if we want to fulfill this commandment, 
We have to apply the action to it. Do something nice. Do something loving for someone else. And that is how you fulfill this commandment. And maybe, just maybe, you'll actually change whatever might be in your heart that it could actually be without the lamid, which means that it's not just your actions, but it's also permeating your, your, your full self. So that's one of the more famous answers as to how this commandment could be fulfilled. Um, so, but there, there's many other commentaries um, and we're not, we're gonna skip this one because I don't wanna get too into the technical, um, but it, it's sort of the same, the same idea. But let us, let us dig a little deeper here because the mitzvah is not, it, even with the lament of telling us to do nice things for our friends, it's still a very tall order. And the Rambam, um, when he describes and elucidates all the, all the mitzvahs, here's what he writes and he, it, it, he, he gives us a, a lot of homework and it's not something that, that is easily accomplished. He writes like this, the mitzvah, to, the mitzvah commands us to love our fellow in a manner similar to the love that we have for ourselves. We should direct that same level of dedication to loving and being merciful towards a friend. This applies to their body, their financial concerns, and anything, anything they have or desire. You know, how often do we, you know, uh, have a situation where someone, you know, that we know makes a very bad decision and faces the natural consequences of that decision? And very often in our heads, we're like, well, you know, you don't do the crime. Don't, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime or whatever. In other words, we sort of naturally judge uh, the other person. But if we were in that situation, we would have every excuse in the world of why we made that mistake in the first place. So there's a, there's a natural difference in how we approach other people and how we approach ourselves. And then Amam goes further. Additionally, whatever you desire for yourself, you should desire for another person. As the verse states, you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. So this is still a difficult mitzvah. And, and although it's like, you know, it, it, there are many songs that have it, and it's a, it's a mitzvah that we want to teach the children at a very young age, it's very difficult if we're, if we're being honest and if we're trying to really fulfill it and accomplish it, even with the lit, even with the actionable stuff, it's still very difficult. So what does the Torah really want from us here? So this is what we mentioned earlier. Rashi quotes Rabbi Akiva. This is a fundamental principle of the Torah. But let us go to a little bit of a, we're going to sidetrack as we always do to try to understand a little bit better of what's expected of us. So before we read this Mishnah, we have to understand that there is a, there is a natural connector between every human being, and especially the Jewish people, that is always present whether we want to tap into it or not. And what do we, this is a Mishnah that says, the people of Israel are so beloved that they are called children of God. As a sign of even greater love, it was made known to them that they are called the children of God. As it is said, you are children of Hashem, quoting the verse from Devarim. Now, what is, uh, you know, we mentioned before, sorry, we mentioned before that the, um, the, only, the only time the context of love is actually, you know, simple to understand is between a parent and a child. Even siblings love, it could be a little complicated sometimes. Uh, love between spouses or love between partners is very complicated. Uh, it's obviously very powerful and the most, you know, and the most sought after love that could be achieved, but it's still very complicated. A love between a parent and a child doesn't really lend itself to any complications because it's obvious. A parent loves their child because the child is part of them. The child was, is, is their flesh and blood. And the parent doesn't care if the child is talented or not. Obviously, the parent will, will be proud and excited, but a parent loves their child is, is a natural state. And the same goes the other way around. A, a child loves their parent, and as they should. Uh, so this is why the term, you know, we are the children of Hashem, to sort of give us a, a, a hint as to how we could apply that love to each other as well. So that's what, that, this is where we're going here with the Medrash. The mission of states, the Jewish people are so beloved that they are called the children of God. Indeed, on a soul level, we are all called the children of God. So through following the foregoing, uh, uh, the foregoing instructions of viewing one's body, okay, I'm sorry, let me, before we read this, let me back this up for a second. So in the beginning of the class, we talked about the story of Hillel, where, um, where this convert came to the, the study house of Shammai and said he wants to study the whole Torah on one foot uh, while he stands on one foot and he was sent out and he comes to the study house of Hillel 
And he was told, what you don't like, don't do to a friend. And the rest is explanation, go study. That was, that was literally the line that Hillel told him. So the, the Alte Rebbe asks a question. Um, that, or, and it's, not, it's a very obvious question. The Torah has 613 commandments. Um, of those commandments, many are between us and God. And many are between us and other people. So, for example, do not steal, do not kill, love your fellow as your, you know, all the, or honor your parents. These are commandments that are between people. But there are other commandments like Shabbat, like tefillin, like uh, Shabbos candles, like, um, like all the, all like celebrating the holidays and all the different commandments that are between us and God that help us develop our connection with Hashem. So it's understandable how Hillel's statement about do not do unto others what you don't want someone to do to you is representative of all the mitzvahs between human beings. But how does it represent mitzvah, a mitzvah that is between us and God? How does that cover Shabbat? How does that cover tefillin? How does that cover prayer? How does that cover studying the Torah? How does that cover um, just about any mitzvah that um, that God between us and God. So this is where the answer is being discussed, and this is in the Tanya. The Tanya writes through the following, following the foregoing instructions of viewing one's body as lowly and above. I'm just going to mute everyone. Just to, um, you're welcome to mute if you have any questions. Um, but just to make sure, just to limit the background noise. Um, so basically, what does a mitzvah, so I'm going to say the answer verbally because it's easier to, to explain. So the, the Altenev is answering this question about how Hillel's statement could represent the entire Torah. So what happens when we do a mitzvah, any mitzvah, a mitzvah between us and God, whether it's, you know, putting out the fill in or, or lighting Shabbat candles or, or um, not wearing shotness or whatever the mitzvah might be. Um, or a mitzvah that we have between each other, whatever the mitzvah is, when we do a mitzvah because God commanded us to do that mitzvah, it makes us more spiritual. And what that means is, is it allows our soul, our neshama to shine through and overpower our physical animalistic self. And as we know, there's always a battle going on between our physical being, our, our animalistic side, which is instinctive and just wants to follow its desires and our spiritual side, which wants to cling and become closer to God. When we do something animalistic, when we just follow our instincts, then our animal is in charge and our, our physical is more important. Everything else, everything material is important to us, while spirituality is, is, is not important. But to the flip side, when we do a mitzvah, we become, our soul takes over and becomes in charge, at least momentarily, and is shining through to fulfill and to reveal itself to the world and to those around the person. So when we do what we're supposed to do, we study Torah and we, and we do mitzvahs, we actually ensure that our soul is the dominant one and in charge. And what happens when our soul is in charge? Well, we see other people and we see other souls. We don't just see other bodies because the, the physical body is what separates us. In other words, the way we look, the way we talk, the way we um, behave, uh, all these types of things are physical attributes that usually are the sources of conflicts between people. But if you remove that and your focus is on your soul, then naturally you're going to love and care about everyone else because we're all connected and we all have the same father, the same source in God. So let me just read it now. So through, the follow, through following these instructions of focusing on matters of the soul and rejoicing in matters of the soul, it becomes possible to fulfill the commandment of love your fellow as yourself towards every Jew from young to old. Because now you're not seeing the body. You're not seeing what separates us. You're seeing what unites us. You're seeing the common denominator. It's almost as if when you're, when you're trying to make friends in a place of people where you disagree with them on just about everything. So what you want to do is you want to find a common denominator, something that you both could relate to and build a relationship off of that. Well, guess what? We all have that built in. We have that neshama. We all are part of, we're part of God. And when our neshama, when you make your neshama shine and become the dominant player within yourself, you're naturally going to see in other people the neshama also. And you're going to recognize the connection that you have with them 
and what your goal is to bring them closer. Um, this is this is crucial. This is very important because, you know, when the Chabad outreach when Chabad outreach was you know taking off and and shluchim were go, and emissaries were going to all different places, so many Orthodox Jews had a very big problem with it by saying that how could a religious family move to a place where there's no one else who's observant of Torah mitzvahs and remain true to the true to their beliefs, not be influenced negatively, and also how are they able to um, you know, fraternize with other people who are so against against their way of life. And this is where Alan Dershowitz um, uh, articulated beautifully in, in his speech at the at a Chabad convention, where he said that Chabad looks to focus on what we agree on, and let's not focus on what we disagree on. In other words, there's plenty that separates us. There's plenty of things that that could could rip us apart. But let us find those things that connect us and that unite us and let's celebrate those things and ensure that those are the things that are bringing us together because that is how we're going to develop connections on, a, on, on an even deeper level. And this is why the Rebbe was always adamant that when we see someone or we connect with someone, we have to look at the neshama and not just look, not look at, the, at, you know, at the behavior or things that we might find uh, contrary to the Torah. All right, so the Altadeva goes on. This is especially so if you consider that all souls complement one another and have one father. So this is why all Jews are called brothers because we are literally brothers at the root of our souls in God's oneness. It is only our bodies that separate us. And it continues, those who view their body as primary and their soul as secondary are incapable of reaching that true love of brotherhood because they're focused, it's only if their bodies connect, it's only if their physical, um, their physical attributes connect, but their soul connection is, is, is not gonna be apparent. Only love that is contingent upon an outside factor. So for example, if someone is very wealthy and they have lots of resources and connections and lots of toys and I, I may say toy, I mean like, like lots of goodies, they have a yacht, they have all these cool stuff. So everyone wants to be their friend. Everyone wants to connect with them because of the physical attributes of this person. And if that person loses all their money, and loses all the things that made them so popular, then no one wants to hang out with them anymore because it was never about the person themselves. It was about all the physical stuff that went around. And the same goes for a love and a relationship. If the relationship, uh, a marriage or a, a, a couple, his relationship is based on external factors and it's very hard for it to last. It's the soul that allows us to transcend and combine our existence because that's where we're all connected naturally anyways. So now that we know how the mitzvah is meant to be observed is by revealing our soul and by focusing on our soul. Let's still be, let's still be realistic and practical. How do we reveal our soul? How are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to see someone else who we despise and just focus on their soul? We're humans. Let's be real. That's very difficult to do. So we're going to have a little, um, a little, uh, um, uh, what do we call it? A guide on how we could focus and emphasize the soul, our soul and the soul of someone else. This is actually a, a bit of a how-to. So let's start with this st famous statement from Hillel. Um, and he says like this, be like the students of our love peace and pursuing peace, love one's fellow creatures and bringing them close to Torah. All right, we're going to underline those last five words, bringing them close to Torah. In Hebrew, it's two words, in the Karvel na Torah. That what is the key factor here of being able to reveal our own soul and being able to reveal someone else's soul? It's by connecting them with the source, connecting them with Torah. All right, so what does that mean practically? So the Alter Rebbe actually um, uh, points out that there's something very strong over here, where Hillel refers to those who are distant from Hashem and his service as creatures, because they're animal souls in charge. And if they're animal souls in charge, then they're, you know, creatures is more, and, and this is Hillel, this is the kind, loving Hillel, who said that if people are distant from Torah, then they're considered creatures. But putting aside the negativity of it, it's only an inspiration that the way we connect with someone truly is by bringing them to the Torah. How is that done? So let's start going through this. Surely there are other ways to express love to another Jew besides bringing them close to the Torah. So the Ramam writes like this, every Jew is commanded to love every Jew like him or herself. As the verse states, love your fellow as yourself. Therefore, 
speak positively about them and be careful with their possessions uh, and with their honor, just as you would for yourself. So the Rebbe explains like this. With the words bringing them close to the Torah, Hillel is pointing out that although we must love every Jew, we may not compromise on Torah standards when doing so. And this is very important. We can't break a rule of Torah just to you know, worry about someone else's feelings. We're there to bring them closer to Torah. So we can't, and this is something that you know, shluchim have a tough time with sometimes because very often they could be asked to do something that's counter to the Torah, but in order to keep the peace, you know, sometimes they're tempted to do it. So the Rebbe is warning us that Hillel's, is, is, Hillel's point here is that we're not allowed to compromise our standards. And this is something that people respect, is that when we don't compromise our standards, people actually are, are drawn to that. So the love we must exhibit ought to draw others close to Torah, but never by lowering or compromising the Torah to an unholy level. So here we have tip number one, which is the way we connect, we bring out our own soul and reveal our own soul. And the way we reveal someone else's soul is by bringing them to Torah. So if we want to love someone, we have to study with them. We have to learn with them. Um, and by the way, whoever, if you're learning with someone else, you're actually gaining more than they are because you're revealing your own neshama as well. As we read before, that each neshama completes another neshama. A soul cannot exist on its own. A soul needs another soul uh, or multiple souls in order for it to fulfill its mission and, 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 and complete itself. All right, so now, but that's not enough because just, be, just comparing them to Torah uh, or bringing them closer to the Torah can be very difficult. So this right here is the revolutionary Chabad, Hasidus Chabad approach of how we see another person. And this right here is the underlying factor of, of, of not just how we see other people, about what we truly believe down to our core. Um, and this is from the, the fifth Chabad Rabbi. And he, he, he writes, this is very deep and very strong, but it's also very powerful. Where does the neshama, where does the soul come from? Obviously it comes from God, but so does the Torah. The Torah comes from God also. So, how does that work? So here's what he writes. As it is sourced in Hashem's essence, atzmos, the soul comes from God's essence. Uh, the, the Torah comes from God's wisdom. Wisdom is not the essence. Your mind is not your essence. Your mind is very close to you. It's a part of you, but it's not your essence. So the Torah comes from Hashem's wisdom or Hashem's intellect, so to speak. But the soul, the neshama, comes from God's essence. And the proof for this is in the concept of teshuvah. Even someone who violated every precept of the Torah can still return to Hashem. If, if a neshama was not sourced from atzmos, from God's essence, if he violated the Torah, he forfeits his right to exist. How would he be able to repent? How would he be able to do teshuvah? The very fact that teshuvah exists, the very fact that a person could return to Hashem and connect to Hashem means that their soul is actually sourced from a deeper level within God than the Torah itself. So nothing can stand in the way of teshuva, and this can only be to, due to the su superiority of the soul. So the, the neshama is so powerful, is so pure, and so essential that it comes from the essence of God. Now, this doesn't mean we can neglect the Torah. God wants us to connect to him and reveal his presence in the world through the Torah and through the mitzvahs. So that's how it's supposed to be. However, if we're talking about um, you know, the source of someone's existence, we have to recognize that a neshama actually comes from a higher source than Torah. And as much as a Jew's soul is rooted in a loftier space than even the Torah itself, a Jew remains a Jew even after they sin or violate the Torah. No matter how much a Jew has sinned, he does not lose his status as a Jew. This is because the neshama, the soul's connection with Hashem, is not contingent upon its level of Torah mitzvah performance. This right here is the core of Chabad. This is not to say that it's okay to violate the Torah. It's not okay. And this is not to say that our, our goal needs to be to bring people closer to the Torah as we just read. But this is for us to recognize that when we come and we see and we connect with someone else, we realize that that person, no matter how distant or non-observant they may seem, they have an neshama, they have a soul that is so deeply connected with Hashem that it transcends any possible disconnect that could exist. And when you see that neshama, you see that person, it doesn't matter how they look. It doesn't matter what they, what they ate for lunch. It doesn't matter what sins they've committed because their connection can never be broken. 
Now it's time to celebrate that connection through the Torah and mitzvahs. But that connection is so deep and it can never ever be un, unhinged or, or unhooked. So if we want to truly bring out the power or the, or the glory of the soul that God gave us, which is usually hidden and usually not revealed because we're human beings. And as human beings, we are naturally inclined to focus on our instincts and our animalistic selves. But if we want to see the truth in ourselves, if we want to find ourselves, the trick and the only trick is to focus on somebody else. When you look at somebody else who you naturally might despise, who you naturally might judge, who you're going to sort of not be impressed with, and you decide to overlook all of that and just see them for their neshama and focus on their soul, that is how you, re you realize the validity and the power of your own neshama as well. Because if you see their soul, you're naturally going to see your soul as well. So all these self-help and, and, and um, this billion dollar industry of trying to help people find themselves is garbage. If you wanna find yourself, focus on somebody else. Direct your attention to somebody else. Find someone who you're not so impressed with and work on yourself to discover their soul. Bring them closer to the Torah so they can celebrate their soul. And by doing that, your neshama will be revealed naturally and in a more powerful way than you could ever imagine. And this, by the way, was the secret of the Chabad emissaries that the Rebbe sent out, because they were not perfect. The, the emissaries that went out to Shluchim, they're, they're human beings just like everyone else. They had their desires just like everyone else. But because their position was where they had to focus and emphasize the other person, that was their job. You go to a community, your job is to take care of the community, take care of other people. And by doing that, it helped them bring out their own neshama as well. And that's why now it's like everyone, everyone lines up to be a Chabad emissary because the power and the impact is not just what you impact in your community, but it's the impact you have on yourself. And this is a core philosophy of, of Chabad. So it's not that we are okay with, with violating the Torah. It's not that we're okay with sins or things that go contrary to Torah. God forbid, we still want to do everything we can to teach and to educate and inspire um, uh, observance of Torah and mitzvahs. But at the same time, we don't see that as a contingency with, their, with a person's connection with the God, because their, their connection with Hashem is so deep and so beyond anything we can even imagine. All right, so the neshama is connected to Hashem regardless of Torah. But the only way for us to feel that connection is through Torah. So when we study Torah and do mitzvahs, is how we celebrate that connection. It's almost like if you're married or if you have a, a, a partner or a, a strong relationship, so it's not enough just to know that you, you're married. You have to do stuff. You have to have date nights. You have to have um, time, you know, uh, times where you celebrate your relationship. It doesn't mean that your relationship wasn't strong before and now it's stronger, but you want to celebrate something that is deeply connected to you. So our neshama is part of God and it's naturally connected, but we still have to celebrate it. And the way we celebrate it is by doing what Hashem wants, by studying Torah and doing this. Um, all right, one second. Let's, I, I, sorry, let's go back to that one second. A person's soul is a candle of Hashem, is an is a is a ambassador in this world to light up the world and be a candle of Hashem, revealing its innermost, the deepest parts of, of Hashem's presence in the world. And the Nebuchadnezzar goes on to say, the core quality of a Jew must manifest through Torah. As such, when another Jew remains distant from Torah, the true harmony and love that exists between that Jew and all other Jews cannot truly manifest if there's no Torah. The reality is that they all share a common soul if left untapped, and the way they connect it is through the Torah. So precisely through bringing another closer to Torah, thus connecting them with Hashem, we can appreciate and feel the essential quality of a Jew higher even than the Torah. So it's through the Torah that we can recognize that we're even greater than the Torah. We need the Torah, though, to help us do that. So you cannot just say, I'm going to rely on my deep connection to Hashem, because then what's the point? What's the point of being born? Because the neshama is connected to Hashem even before we're born. We're here because we have the ability to connect with Hashem on a, in a whole new level by studying Torah and doing mitzvahs. And that's how we connect with somebody else is by bringing them closer to the Torah. There was a sto famous story in the Talmud that uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the author of the Mishnah, before he passed away, he was very, he was very sick. And 
Um, it was, he was considered to be the, more, the most beloved leader of the Jewish people at the time and even beyond. He was, in fact, the, the Talmud and, and Halacha refer to him as Rebbe. He's the only one who has that title, as the Rebbe. Whenever it says Rebbe, it's referring to Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, uh, or Rabbi Judah the Prince, as he's known in, in English. Uh, so but what, before he passed away, a heavenly voice came down and said, anybody who is with Rabbi Yehuda Anasi when he passes away is going to have a share in the world to come. And not only that, they'll be in the place where Rabbi Yehuda Anasi is. So it's basically like a free entry pass to, to the Garden of Eden when, you know, when their time comes. So there was a simple uh, uh, laundry man who used to do people's laundry. That was his job. And when he heard this heavenly voice, he, he wanted to be present when Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi passed away. So he made sure to cancel all of his, uh, all of his you know, appointments. And by the time he got to, uh, to the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, he saw everybody mourning and crying. And he realized that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi had already passed away. And now he was so depressed, he missed his chance. And he was so broken and he was so, he was so disheartened, he was so disheartened that he just didn't realize where he was going and he fell off a roof and he passed away. Or actually, I'm sorry, the Talmud says he jumped off a roof and passed away. Um, and a heavenly voice came out after that and said, this man will also have a, have a place in the world to come next to Rabbi Hodan Asim. So the Talmud goes crazy, wait, one second. The Torah forbids us from taking our own life. It's against the Torah. How can the Torah say, how can the Talmud tell us a story that, you know, the heavens, in other words, the godly voice came out and affirmed this person's action when it's a counter to the Torah? And the Talmud doesn't really answer it. But the Hasidus answers the question because this is weird. When somebody taps into the essence of their soul, like this person did, they transcend that connection transcends the laws of the Torah. It's very, it's, not, it's very difficult to do, and we're not allowed to do it. In other words, like we can't just say, oh, because I, my connection transcends, so I'm going to know. This, this person was on a level, reached a point and reached a level where his, his connection to Hashem was so deep and so revealed that it transcended any of the laws of the Torah, which is why he was able to merit, the, uh, merit the, you know, a, sp- a place in the Garden of Eden next to Rabbi Oda Anasi. Um, so the idea is that we recognize and we know that we have this con- deep connection to, the, to God, but at the same time, the way we're supposed to live our lives and the way we're supposed to connect to God in a natural way is through the Torah and the mitzvahs. And there's one final piece we'll finish off with. Um, actually, no, this was the story that we, um, that we said, or this was the Hillel and Shammai story. So we read this already. Um, but just to finalize, the question is that the mission of Judaism, the mission of being in this world is to reveal the hidden light. It is therefore quite appropriate to refer, refer to this mitzvah as the foundation of the entire Torah, because this mitzvah is what forces us to, to recognize that it's the neshama that's most important and we have to reveal our neshama. And when we do that with someone else, we're able to reveal our own neshama as well. So let us hope that we could all, with all the division that's in the world and all the hate and all the um, you know, uh, divide that's going on around the world, let's hope that we could make a dent in that by revealing our neshamas and revealing each other's neshama and bringing each other closer to Torah and thereby bringing peace into the world through becoming a Mashiach. It's Thank cool. You. Thank you all for joining. Beautiful class. Beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you.